Over the last number of sessions, we have been analyzing five contemporary challenges to Jewish peoplehood. The discourse on nationalism, the debates around Zionism, the lack of consensus on anti-Semitism, the challenge of dual loyalty, and the shifts in the core objectives of Jews in North America. We will now shift from, anal from an analysis of central centrifugal forces and begin to explore different ways for conceiving and reconceptualizing our togetherness. What frameworks and models have been used in the past to define and govern the relationship between Israel and world Jordan? As we will show, it is precisely these models of togetherness and peoplehood which are today backfiring. Instead of bringing us together, they're pulling us apart. To reinvigorate Jewish peoplehood, what is required is that we reimagine the content of each model and more importantly, the relationship they can have with each other. I will then explore these issues in greater depth in an interview with rabbis Sarah Loria and Lauren Burke. Let's begin with briefly analyzing all the definitions. The following definitions are obviously not meant to exhaust each of the meanings of the categories, but to focus principally on those aspects which pertain to Jewish collective identity and which impact the relationship between Israel and world Jewry. When we speak about the Jewish people as family, we speak principally of an involuntary relationship which one inherits and does not choose similar to the Judaism of being discussed earlier in this series. This is what we mean by family. In the context of a community, the family metaphor is generally, as I argued before, not intended as a literal racial category, but rather, if you will, as an imagined family, a community that chooses to view each other as historically connected, and that being part of a family generates a core, unconditional mutual obligation. Family means being there for each other. Family means having each other's back. Family is the principal and first source of identity. There is no option for exit. Estrangement, anger, disappointment, yes, but exit, no. Now, as distinct from family, all the other categories are essentially voluntary. You can and have to choose to join and there exists an option for exiting and breaking, and breaking the bond when the reasons for the choice have expired. Fellow believers are a group of people who join together by virtue of a shared belief or commitment to embody or promulgate a value, principle, or cause. To be part of the Jewish people is to be part of a group with a common mission, to be holy, to commit to tikkun olam, to serve as a light unto the nations, to be God's witness, to not give Hitler a posthumous victory, to name but a few. One joins because of one's identification with the mission. One can exit if one so chooses. The primary motivation for such an exit may be when one believes that the mission is no longer shared or no longer relevant or compelling. Partners are groups of individuals who join in a common undertaking with and for a particular purpose. It can be to further a certain belief, but it can also be for less idealistic reasons, such as one's safety or self-interest. What is important about this specific category in the context of the relationship between Israel and world Jewry is that partners share in both the risks and the profits. While exit is possible, one cannot exit at will. If there are losses or liabilities, one remains responsible. To be a partner is to be a partner together in good times and bad. One exit the, partner, the partnership principally when the aim of the partnership is no longer shared, when it has been achieved, or when one of the partners is perceived to be acting in bad faith. Investors do not share in the mutual obligations of partners. They invest with the aim of gaining or facilitating a particular end or outcome. What is particular about this category and the reason it is important in the context of Israel and world Jewry is that it involves the expenditure of money, capital, or resources. And such expenditures are always complicated. An essential aspect of the, of the investor relationship is that it embodies a core asymmetry between the one with the capital and the one being invested in, 
and the inherent power and need imbalance which it implies. The investor exits with relative ease once the outcome has been achieved, when there are unacceptable losses, or when the investor believes that achieving the particular outcome is no longer possible or shared by the investee. Consumers are not essentially a community with a shared purpose, but instead a group of individuals who expend capital for the sake of attaining personal benefits from the use of goods and services. Exit here is the simplest. It could be the result of disappointment with the product, but can and is often simply the result of competition, a new product which seems to be better or which is simply new. Let's now delve more deeply in the first and last categories, which on the surface are diametrically opposed, family and consumer, and their implications for the relationship between Israel and world Jewry. Since our inception as a people, Jews saw each other and the foundation of our collective identity in terms of family. It is the core feature of the covenant of being which we studied at the beginning of this series. When God said to Abraham, leave your land, your birthplace, your father's house, and go to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, that nation was defined as being constituted by the descendants of Abraham, his family. The original name of our people is the family name, the children of Israel. Even the current name, Jew, represents our family origins, being derived from, our, from, from the story of our shared descent from the tribe of Judah. To belong, one either had to be born or marry into the family. Now, since Jewishness is not a race, one can join through conversion. However, if one converts, one is viewed as joining the family and is considered to have become a descendant of Abraham. In the words of the rabbis, a convert is similar to a child who is born, reborn into the family with no exit option similar to a Jew by birth. As discussed at length in the lecture on the covenant of being, a core expression of Jewish people as family is found in the principle of Jewish law which determines that a Jew, even when they have sinned, is still and always a Jew. Just as problematic behavior, while possibly impacting on one's relationships with one's parents, does not alter one's status as their child, so too problematic behavior may be censured, but does not impact on one's core identity as a Jew. It is as a family that we ultimately emerged from 2,000 years of exile and returned to our home and rebuilt in Israel the national homeland of the family. Within this state, as expressed in Israel's law of return, all who have any family ties, who are seen by others as part of the family, are invited to come home and are granted automatic citizenship. For decades, North American Jewish support for Israel was also principally founded on this notion of family. Unlike Israeli Jews, to be a Zionist in North America did not mean a commitment to move to Israel or even to see it as the center of Jewish life, but rather to support the family in Israel, to have their back. We are one in a way that only family members understood. We do not have to agree. We don't even have to like each other, but we are a family and mutual loyalty is a given. One of the important transformations taking place principally in the North American Jewish community is that increasingly Jews are approaching their membership in the community and its institutions also from the perspective of a consumer. Jewishness is seen less and less as an inherited and involuntary identity and more as a choice that one can make. In this context, individuals are asking, why should I belong? What am I getting out of it? As consumers, one only chooses to use a product, or in the case of Jewishness, to actively belong, to the extent that belonging is perceived to be important, beneficial, and adding a value. As a consumer, just as one chooses a Jewish identity, one, also, one can also choose a different institution, an identity to the extent that they better meet one's needs. In North America, for example, being American or Canadian can constitute a viable alternative identity to one's Jewishness. North American Jewish institutions such as federations, synagogues, and Jewish community centers, which for decades counted on guaranteed membership as a result of the fact that they served essentially as community settings for the family, 
are now facing dramatically decreased affiliation. If in the past the Jew belonged, joined, and contributed to the family's institutions simply because they were Jews, together that is no longer a given. Institutions which did not have to compete for loyalty find themselves challenged to make a case for why someone should join or belong. The shift to the consumer framework has been a mixed blessing. On the one hand, it represents a loss of thickness that family connections imply, and a challenge as Jewishness and its collective consciousness are, lo are no longer a given and a necessary aspect of one's identity. However, at the same time, while family creates intense relationships and commitments, it can also create relationships which you take, where you take people for granted. You don't pick your family. Family assumes a deep bond which you do not necessarily have to nurture and as a result can in many cases become atrophy due to neglect. Consumers, on the other hand, demands attention as you are forced to constantly work to maintain the interest and commitment of your consumers while ever mindful of the competition. You must know your consumer and respond to their needs and interests, for otherwise they'll simply leave. Consumers is challenging the Jewish family to answer, what and why are you doing that? How do you speak to my needs? How do you speak to me in a way that sees me, hears me, makes room for me? While it can be challenging, it has also forced a reevaluation and renaissance of Jewish communal institutions as they can no longer simply assume loyalty and belonging and instead need to work to innovate, to meet and respond to the needs and expectations of their members. Now Israelis, just like their North American counterparts, are increasingly adopting a consumerist outlook in many areas of their lives. Startup Nation has taught Israelis to work for, expect, and demand quality and excellence. When it comes to their Jewishness, however, they are stu still predominantly motivated by the family model. Even while more and more Israelis do Jewish in different ways, they do so principally because it, because it is the tradition of the family. That is why they're still willing to use services that they find less compelling, such as the official rabbinate, and prefer to not go to a synagogue rather than to fight to create a synagogue which would meet their needs as consumers. In many ways, one of the great challenges of Jewish education in Israel is how to move Israelis to adopt a startup consciousness in their Jewish lives as well. When they do, new avenues will be open for relationship and partnership with world Jewry. We will discuss this further in the next session. Now what happens when one community sees Jewishness predominantly in terms of the family model, while the other increasingly adopts a consumer's perspective? While North American Jews are adding greater weight to their consumerist sensibilities, Israelis still predominantly think in terms of the family model. Whether in the law of return or as you studied in the new nation state law, they assume a deep sense of loyalty and responsibility for all Jews worldwide who find themselves in danger, principally physical dangers, but also spiritual dangers as well. As family, Israelis expect the same loyalty in return from North American Jews. Like many families, we don't need to see each other often, understand each other, or even like each other. But in times of need, you're expected to be on my side. It doesn't matter whether you agree with the occupation or Israel's policies regarding state and religion. It doesn't matter whether you feel affronted or insulted. You don't need to like me. We are family, and as such, we expect you to limit your criticism and to simply stand with us when we ask and whenever, and whenever we need. At the same time that Israelis are looking for and expecting family loyalty, Consumerist North American Jews are asking of Israel the same questions that they are directing to their own institutions, questions of value, meaning, and importance. An Israel which does not know or respond to North American Jewry's needs, sensitivities, or sensibilities will not be able to sustain a relationship with individuals who have a choice whether to enter into a relationship and who increasingly have an alternate, comfortable, communal identity in North America. In this context, Israel's policies will not be overlooked and instead will shape the case either for or against a relationship. 
The family model, however, is challenged not merely by increased consumerism within North American Jewry, but principally by an inherent weakness within the family model for contemporary Jewish life. The family model assumes that we're brothers and sisters, and that this tie is the one which is most meaningful and significant. This, however, is true only when siblings are young. As we grow older and enter additional committed relationships, we forge new family ties with our spouses or significant others, which also claim our loyalty. And in most cases, at least where the relationship is healthy, in fact, take precedence. Until the latter part of the 20th century, Jewishness was the singular and principal identity through which a Jew saw themselves and viewed the world. The constant onslaught of anti-Semitism ensured and ensconced this singularity as we were excluded from belonging to other groups and communities. Being othered by the world preserved our Jewish identity in a form of adolescence, where our principal ties were with each other. There was no one else with whom we could enter into a deep relationship. As a result, loyalty to our people or family was strong and always took precedence. Post-Holocaust Jewish life in Israel and North America has brought about a change in the singularity and exclusiveness of our Jewish identity, which instead simultaneously encompasses multiple and complex identities. In Israel, for example, we are no longer exclusively Jews, but also Israelis. Similarly, in North America, we are American and Canadian alongside our Jewishness. In essence, we are like siblings who, as adults, have embraced new relationships and commitments. Israelis may see Jewry as family, which can and does make demands upon Israel. But as Israelis, we have to give primacy to, to the needs, demands, and interests of our new spouse, Israel. Israel's political and security interests, not to speak of coalition demands, must naturally take precedence. Similarly, American and Canadian Jews have found and built a home in North America. They're not a diaspora and are deeply grateful for the love and acceptance they experience with their new family and recognize the claims it makes upon them. This new mature reality of family with new and multiple commitments is a blessing which 2,000 years of Jewish life aspired toward. At the same time, however, this new reality is the source of significant tension between Israel and North American Jews. When Israel's Prime Minister Netanyahu attacked President Obama and his proposed deal with Iran on the floor of the US Congress in Washington, he felt that he was representing the interests of Israel and turned to his family in North America, the Jews, demanding their support against a policy that he believed to be existentially dangerous to Israel. He turned to North American Jewry as brothers and sisters and demanded the loyalty that family members have a right to expect. What he forgot was that American Jews are not merely siblings who happen to not be living at home, Israel, but siblings who are Americans and who are engaged in a deep and intense relationship with being American. President Obama was not merely the president of the United States, but their president. And an affront to their president was comparable to entering one's sibling's home and attacking their spouse and family. Conversely, North American Jewish leadership experienced Israel's reneging on the Kotel deal as a failure of loyalty. As part of the family, liberal Jews rightfully expected a space in the family home, a public recognition of their legitimacy, not a legitimacy of their Judaism, but a legitimacy of their status as members of the family. They could not understand the government's reversal of support, nor the apathy of the majority of Israeli Jews to their requests. Similar to Prime Minister Netanyahu, they forgot that Israeli Jews, while embracing all Jews as members of the family, have a deeper commitment and give prioritization to Israeli Jews' needs and interests. Most Israeli Jews don't perceive egalitarian prayer at the Kotel as a spiritual need. Remember, they're not consumerists when it comes to Judaism. And so they chose to give greater weight to sustaining their coalition government over those of liberal American Jews. They chose to prioritize what they believe were the interests of Israeli Jews over those of North America. 
the Israeli mantra, come to Israel and vote, and then we will take your needs into account, is not meant as a superficial dismissal, but rather as an invitation to, em to embrace a hyphenated Israeli identity as distinct from a hyphenated North American Jewish identity. Join my new subfamily, and only then will you claim my principal loyalty. To conclude, the family model, which was, which was one of, if not the, central carrier of Jewish collective life for more than 3,000 years, presently faces significant challenges. The first is that it is subject to competition from the consumer's model that is playing an ever-increasingly significant role in Jewish life in North America. While Jewish consumers do not necessarily reject and exclude themselves from the family model, they do not experience the family model as sufficient and demand that Judaism, like the Jewish people, and Israel represent a product which provides meaning and value to their lives. They are no longer satisfied with being Jewish and being committed to Jewish peoplehood and Israel simply because, simply because of a sense of shared past and origins which one inherited and which demands loyalty and reprioritization. Regardless of how one feels about this consumerist move in Jewish life, whether one sees it as a challenge or a blessing, personally, I believe it is both, it is here to stay. While family consciousness may be strengthened through various educational and experiential in interventions, we can no longer simply assume the loyalty of Jews to Israel as a given. We have to earn it. And earning it will require not merely a discourse of responsibilities, but of policies as well. Furthermore, even if somehow the fam family motto miraculously underwent a revival among the next generation of North American Jews, it's important that we recognize that it can no longer have the same significance for 21st century Jewish life. As discussed at the outset of this series, we are a people with two homes, and these two homes also contain two distinct families. We have matured as a people and built sub-family units within the larger family structure, which claim our loyalty in ways that mitigate the singular Jewish family bond. We are Israeli, American, Canadian Jews. We are hyphenated Jews with Israel, the United States, and Canada making demands and expecting prioritization. The mythic, idealized Jewish family model of Hine matovu manayim shevet achin gam yachad, how good and pleasant is it when brothers and sisters sit together, cannot be recreated for a contemporary, hyphenated, multi-encumbered contemporary Jewish life. Paradoxically, for the family to reinstitute itself in the life of adult siblings, it has to adopt a consumerist consciousness. To overcome the particular loyalties of our subfamilies, like United States, Canada, or Israel, the family cannot merely refer to a shared past, but needs to develop a shared meaning and value in the present in the, and in the future. In this way, consumerism, instead of being a threat to the family model, is actually the secret to its salvation. Finally, whether family and consumer compete or complete each other, the mere recognition of the existence of the two models is critical in, in reestablishing a healthy relationship between Israel and world Jewry. Assuming that the other is functioning within one's own predominant model and without understanding that the other may be functioning within a completely different set of considerations is a prescription for mutual alienation. As in all relationships, we don't always have to agree with each other. But if we understand the other, we have the possibility of avoiding conflict, developing greater mutual respect, and beginning to lay solid foundations for a new shared future. Thank you. In the last lecture, we studied the ideas of family and consumer, two categories that define Jewish identity, collective and individual. Family was the model that shaped Jewish people's understanding of who we are as a community. 
We're a family. And that defined Jewishness for close to 3,500 years. Over the last number of decades, a new idea is emerging, which is shaping Jewish collective life, in which Jews see themselves increasingly as consumers. Today, we're joined by two rabbis, Rabbi Sarah Loria and Rabbi Lauren Birkin. Two rabbis who both work within the community, within congregational settings, but not exactly within classical congregational settings. And I want to talk to you about that. Um, Lauren, what is the nature of the congregations that you serve? And how do you experience the impact of consumerism on North American Jewish life? Well, as director of rabbinic programs at Hartman, I have the privilege of working with hundreds of rabbis, most of whom are working in synagogue settings. And I'm also the spouse of a congregational rabbi in Miami. And so I'm deeply immersed in what I see as a deep anxiety that many rabbis face about membership and the declining dues-paying membership of so many synagogues in North America. And I think that rabbis are really facing a catch-22 because living in a consumerist culture where people are addicted to instant gratification, to tangible benefits, to peak moments, rabbis feel an inordinate amount of pressure to perform in those peak moments, to give the most outstanding high holiday sermon, to give the most innovative and transformative bar mitzvah service. Because if they're wrong, people will leave? Because it's the one time in the year they have to deliver to a dues-paying member the product that that member is, is paying for in, in kind of that transactional relationship, the one time they have to touch people's souls, but also the one time they have to retain members in a competing marketplace where there are other options. And the challenge is that on, on a deep level, rabbis know that what humans are yearning for and longing for is a sense of belonging and community. And, um, and the consumer doesn't know that? Well, the consumer that, that wants those peak moments and maybe will only come in an episodic way one time a year, want to walk in that one time a year and feel at home and feel welcomed and feel fully themselves and be able to be open and vulnerable. But we know from a family model that that's not the way relationships are formed. We know if you think about um, families that live far apart from each other, that maybe see each other once a year on Thanksgiving or for a Passover Seder, and the immense pressure families feel that that one meal should be the most perfect family experience of full joy and deep bonding to last until the next year when the full extended family comes back together. And I think it's why so often holidays can be deeply disappointing and depressing because- So are, they, so are these moments deeply um, depressing for the rabbi? I think mm. that the, I think for rabbis, the moments feel insufficient. They're necessary, but not sufficient. We need those peak moments, but when you think about what creates a thick fabric of a family, it's the ongoing, sustained, often boring and mundane daily interactions. And uh, in So the consumer wants family, but sets up a model which gives them something that they think they want, but then in fact they don't really, it's not gonna give them what they really are looking for. I so think that's a sad story. Mm. It's a challenge. And Sarah, what's your experience? I love the idea of Judaism being a family. I run a synagogue, version of a synagogue, an adjacent synagogue out of my house. I run a community out of my house called Beloved. And my family- At your house? At our house. So my family is there. We have four floors in the house. And when we're having prayer on the first floor, my children are yelling because they don't want to go to bed on the second floor. So. If anyone is invested in um, sharing the model of a Jewish family with her community, I would say I am in it. And I think in this moment in American life, um, consumerism has gotten into our bones in a way that is heartbreaking. And I don't, and so I had never thought about consumerism the way you talked about it, which is that it really allows for us to create a marketplace in Jewish life that is vibrant and wonderful, which I am excited about. Um, but what I uh, often see in the consumerism part of America is that 
people are not, uh, there is an understanding that everyone is a product. Every human being is a product. And our, or that we're makers of products. And that's all we do, is that we, we go to work and then we make perfect children, and then we make dinner, and then our lives are picturesque. And I think the consumerism model has been really detrimental to the spirit of American Jews, the spirits of Americans in general, because as we know as countercultural Jews, the neshama is not a product. We are not here, we are not put on this earth to make it, to go to work, we are put on this earth to love and to breathe and to um, be human. And so I think consumerism has taken that away from us in some ways. But you yourself still play a little bit within the consumerist model, don't you? The, you're appealing to Jews who, as consumers, aren't finding their place within a larger congregation. I don't think about it that way. I hear what you're saying. And the way I think about it is that the institutions of the 20th century were set up with the understanding of the family, family loyalty model, right? They, they were set up to understand that Jews support Jews. And so we're gonna build day schools and federations and synagogues and Jews will come and they will join because the family model was strong um, and there was a sense of loyalty and Jews first. I think that since we understand that that model doesn't work as well anymore, what I am trying to do is what I call re-familying. So I'm trying to make family a verb, not a noun. So if, if family is just like, these are the people you're stuck with and you've got to love them no matter what. So family's not something you have to inherit. Exactly. Family is something you actually have to do. Invest in. You have to choose to be obligated, which is the difference, I think, with the consumer model. You have to choose to be obligated to this set of people, but I don't think they're coming in and consuming Judaism at Beloved. Right. Now, in the context of a congregation, of a larger congregation, is the family model dead? Is it possible to recreate it? Well, I would agree with Sarah that we can't separate being part of a family from the doing, the actions. This is your Judaism of being and Judaism of becoming, I think, has a symbiotic relationship. And we know this even just from human relationships and from a healthy family, that feeling that you are part of a family comes from all of the activities you do with your family, whether it's family dinners, whether it's carpool and talking in the car, it's the regular, ongoing, sustained activities that create the fabric of a thick, family identity. And actually, in your father's seminal work, A Living Covenant, um, David Hartman writes about the kinds of laws in the Torah, the mishpatim, which are the moral ethical laws that are shared universally with all humanity, do not kill, do not steal. But he talks about the chukim, those ritual practices of the Jewish tradition, whether it's the holidays or other ritual practices that are, in a sense, the family customs. Those particular practices are what create that sense of family ties and, and family memories. And so I think there needs to be a balance and a relationship between feeling part of a family because that's just who you are and all the things that you do in an ongoing, so sustained way. coming to shul way. is almost, coming to synagogue is almost, it's, it's not coming to the family that you're coerced to belong to, but it's actually coming to your family story. Right, and the challenge is if you only come once or twice a year, it's kind of how common. will you create that? That's, that's the great challenge. So I, the problem of, then of, of congregational life is not the family model. No. And both of you are speaking about how people really want the family model. Hmm. That there's, you want, to re you want to turn into a verb. And you were speaking before and about how people, they really want to feel connected. The problem then is that we want family, but we're not investing enough to actually create a sustained one. It's, as you said before, and I'm going to see you once a year. What type of family do we have? So the synagogue, it's not that the family model is dying, but that the frequency, the bandwidth, undermines it because you don't feel it, and then you become a consumer. 
Danielle, you spoke in your lecture about how consumerism can actually help lead to excellence because it inspires rabbis and Jewish communities to create experiences of, of real meaning and quality. And it makes me think about the way in which peak experiential moments can then become the seed for ongoing uh, family. family. Uh, and I think we see this a lot in synagogue communities. Ironically, I think we see this in Israel missions for so many American synagogues, taking a group, a small group from a large synagogue and bringing them on a two week journey to Israel ends up producing years and years of committed members who feel deeply bonded with one another as a mini community, a chavra within the larger synagogue. They become the future lay leadership of the synagogue. And, um, and out of that peak, peak moment where many families are, in a sense, purchasing a intensive Jewish identity investment for their family, and it's an expensive investment, but it's like a family vacation. It, but it's, more, it's, like but it's a pilgrimage. I take my whole family on vacation so that they'll have intense. Families invest in that as well because they know that, you know, it's those memories, this building of those intense experiences that will then um, kind of fuel that I want to come bond. back to the Israel model in, in, a, in a moment because um, something really interesting is happening where you come to Israel not to be at family with Israelis, exactly. but to be at families with yourself. Right. And I want to come back to that exactly. in a moment. But how do you feel this, this idea of creating fa family as a verb through peak experiences? How do you relate to that? I would say what we're doing is the exact opposite. We're doing the um, weaving of relationships. It's not about something out there. It's about something in this room. That's why we do our work in our living room, because you can only have you know, 40 or 50 people in our living room, and we have to look at each other. And we it's very down on earth, not at the peak at all. Mm. Um, I think that what our people experience in the capitalist consumer culture that we have is that um, they themselves as human beings don't matter. It's what they can think about and create and, and produce that really matters. Mm. And then, they go out in culture and that's what they experience. And then they come to Beloved, we hope, and they experience that they themselves matter, that their spirit, it matters that they're there. And it, not just that any 50 people are there, but that each one of those people, it matters that they're there. And if that's a peak experience, then great. That's their peak experience, that I look at them when they come in, I'm so glad you're here. There's wine in the, in the kitchen. I, and, and then we sit together in the living room and we have an experience of being with each other, sharing in small groups. But the, the size of, 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 of your community yeah. gives you opportunities in yeah. many ways. What you're talking about is creating peak experiences for smaller numbers of communities within a congregation that has thousands of people. So is the future of North American Jewish life to move to smaller ones or do we stay, or is it the larger ones breaking down, moving back and forth? Because what Lauren was speaking about is, I, 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 I'm serving, I don't know how many thousand families in this congregation, X, thou, tens, I don't know how many people. So I have to create these mini communities. Is that where we're gonna go or are we gonna, or are the larger communities gonna survive, but with these peak experiences? I'm invested in small scale. You're in small scale. I'm invested in small scale. I think if we wanna communicate family, it's very hard it to do to. it on a large scale. It just is. You don't start by introducing your baby to your extended family and having any one of them take care of the baby. You have your immediate family. And so if we're gonna show people that you're part of a bigger story, they have to feel it in their bodies. And so when they're at Beloved, they feel in their bodies, you are part of this story here of, of the 50 of us. And we have what I called an ancestor wall, which is that we have pictures of Beloved's um, people who have died, people who they've loved who have died on the wall with a mirror. And so they know that their people are in this room with them and that they are also present in this room through the mirror. And I want them to know you are here, your story is part of this place. And, and, and I cannot do that on a large scale. And I do actually think that 
large congregations. Angela Bookdahl said when she took the reins of Central Synagogue, she said, I wanna make this place bigger, meaning I wanna live stream our services, which she does, and I wanna make it smaller, meaning you can't feel this sense of intimacy in a, in a huge place. You have to have that um, family, small family model. I hear you. It's really interesting how these two models of family and consumer are alive in both of your institutions in very, very different ways. And how you dance or speak to, to people who come um, with those two models. And how also, in many ways, you're both trying to revitalize a family model, one within a smaller structure, and one by creating peak moments within, within a community. I wanna shift now for a moment on the way you experience family and consumerism in the relationship to Israel. You spoke about Israel as, I don't know, the vacation, the Disneyland, the place for a peak moment for your community to feel family with each other. What about an experience of family towards Israel? And how is that creatable? Um, do the peak moments do that? Um, or is that something that the six to 10,000 miles away just makes it irrelevant? I think that's a real challenge. I think that you're correct that most Israel missions, Israel becomes the product or the tool for strengthening American Jewish identity in local communities back in America. And it's not about creating genuine family relationships between American Jews and Israelis or a deep nuanced understanding of Israeli society. But I do believe that it is possible to create a more nuanced and rich relationship with but Israel. a family one? I, I do believe that. I believe it can happen through education. Through education. Because in addition to peak experiences that can be immersive and short term, ongoing rich education, which Creates sometimes it, it can so create So in many ways what you're model. doing is exactly, you're doing, you're doing a Sarah move when it comes to Israel. You're saying I can't create peak experiences which create a family with Israel, but I have to do sustained long term engagement with Israel. Does that then create family? I think it creates a sense of obligation, commitment, um, mutual understanding if there is a genuine process of engagement with ideas, with texts, and with people and relationships. And I think the challenge in a consumerist environment is whether people will make that commitment the time that it takes to do the learning and the dialogue because you asked if it's possible um, to create relationships with Israel. I think one of the obstacles for many American Jews today is that they are engaging with Israel in sound bites, in alerts at the bottom of a TV screen, in the way in which social media um, approaches any topic in short form. And Israel is so complex and so nuanced, and there's no way to unpack the layers and layers of complexity and ethical dilemmas and, um, and, and different ways in which American Jews can understand their Jewish identity in this era of sovereignty without taking time um, to study, to grapple with dilemmas. Um. It's like family is only strong when you actually spend the time to know each other. Israelis, Speak about the family model, that they feel that you are family. Do you feel that Israelis feel that you're, do you feel mm. their verbing of family to you? Mm. No. You don't and feel? That, I can't get there because for me, family means intimacy. And so I really think that the, can, I, I want to tell you a story, a short story. Um, I love stories. Okay. Because we're a family. <laughs> when um, we have meditation at Beloved um, every Sunday night for about, we've had it for about a year. And um, often 10 people come, 12 people come. It's a small group. It's a beautiful, we're weaving relationships, all of what I just said about family. Um, then we had a, sun, a Sunday night in, in um, November, the Sunday after Thanksgiving, where we had 30 people at meditation. And I asked, um, you know, what brought you here? And they said, 
I'm so stressed out because I just spent the weekend with my family. <laughs> so I love your vision of a loyal, heart-opened family. I know it's not as simple as that, but I, I also think the word family um, is overlaid with a lot of um, uh, obligation that doesn't feel good. And in a mm -hmm. culture where you get to choose what you're obligated to, mm -hmm. why would you choose something that doesn't feel good if it's not actually your immediate family who you are forced together with on Thanksgiving? I'm not saying this for all people. I'm just saying this was an experience we had at Beloved. So I just am excited to think more about the in-between. There's something about choosing to be obligated and finding meaning out of that choice that feels like it's both family and consumerism and not extreme in either way. It's so interesting. I, oh, yes, I, I also have a story I want to share. Um, and it's also related to that question of family. I think that what is so attractive for people about being part of a family is feeling accepted, feeling seen, feeling known. And we recently had an encounter between a group of North American rabbis and a group of Israeli rabbis for a week, an intensive encounter. Maybe the first time Israeli rabbis and American rabbis had um, that amount of time to dialogue and to study together. And there was a very powerful moment when an American rabbi said to the group, I'm so pained that I've spent my entire adult life learning Hebrew studying Zionist thought, studying Jewish text, feeling that it was my responsibility to get to know Israel and Israelis, and I don't feel it reciprocated. It feels like a one-way street. Have you ever read the hundreds of years of Jewish thought that have come out of the conservative movement and American Jewish thinkers? Have you read our stories? And it was one of those moments, those aha moments, and the Israelis felt, wow, we haven't read your hundreds of years of Jewish scholarship and Jewish thought. We don't See, fully for, know you. We, you know, for Israelis, I could speak for myself, the most significant part of family is loyalty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that I will be there for you mm -hmm. whenever you need me. Mm -hmm. I don't have to like you. I don't have to know you. You just have to know that I have your back. Mm -hmm. And this, this is so embedded in the Zionist story. This is, this is what, it, we, we are a community, maybe it's the embattledness, but it's, and again, it goes back to the tragic model, or the, the, this, what you, either tragedy or challenge, that for Israelis, they actually feel they're phenomenal family members. We're there for you. Mm -hmm. But you're looking for, you're looking for family We're as not a looking verb. for <laughs> instrumental relationships. Yes. We're looking mm -hmm. for, for genuine relationships of, of, of trust and vulnerability and, I think it's a hearing, human yearning, and, and, and we don't seen. feel um, don't that feel we're that. seen and, and known. Family, consumer, stories, challenge, is it a tragedy? Sometimes it's also a comedy of errors. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a dance. I want to thank you, uh, Sarah and Lauren, for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you.